I said that to myself, but I realized my focus, my real focus, and what I even was saying to, to Sarah this morning, my focus was, I'm tired, I'm so overwhelmed, we have 12 shows today. And I'm like, wait a minute. I was, I was deliberately perpetuating <laughs> not bringing the joy. Right. And I had to check myself. Good distinction, that's a huge distinction. Yeah, well, and, and, and I realized my focus is just mad. It's the things I don't want, the things I'm not even wanting to happen are getting bigger today. All because of my own head, not because of all the distractions around me, not because of any of that, right? And so it's all what I was choosing to focus on and, and actually say out loud in the case of today. As you've built all these huge things throughout your career, mm -hmm. how did you stay focused especially in an industry, you were in the beauty industry. Uh, I don't know if that's the proper way to describe it. Uh, but how did you stay focused? Because clearly, as you get more successful, more people want to put things on your plate, more distractions come available, then social media yeah. comes out. And it's like, <laughs> I mean, how, how are you, how are yeah. you, what are your practices for staying focused? I think people would be really fascinated by that. Yeah, you know, today, I'm actually, I was thinking about this before we hopped on, like today, I'm really having to implement, um, tools on focus and you know maybe a lot of people live with us right now can relate to this but even though i have a lot of distractions going on like today my biggest distraction honestly has been my own head my own myself right how many times do we like get in the way of ourself and here's what i've been really practicing today brendan already today, but then also over the years as well, is focusing on what I'm saying to myself and what I'm acknowledging. Um, I started my morning off feeling super overwhelmed, literally almost in tears. And and I don't I, believe I, it. <laughs> I don't believe it. What? I did. You're and never I, overwhelmed. I You're caught never myself. In tears. No, it's like the, these things we say to ourselves, once we acknowledge them, I feel like we make them real. And we need to check ourselves. I had to check myself this morning when it comes to focus because for for a while I was focusing on like I'm so overwhelmed and I'm so tired, <laughs> right? Those are the things I was saying to myself. I'm like, oh, and and all that did was perpetuate those feelings. And you know, and I was like, yeah, but it, you know, and I told myself, oh, but I'm so grateful, and this is a once in a lifetime week, and all those things. I said that to myself, but I realized my focus, my real focus, and what I even was saying to, to Sarah this morning, my focus was, I'm tired, I'm so overwhelmed, we have 12 shows today. And I'm like, wait a minute. I was, I was deliberately perpetuating <laughs> not bringing the joy. Right. And I had to check myself. Good distinction, that's a huge distinction. Yeah. Well, and, and, and I realized my focus is just mad. It's the things I don't want, the things I'm not even wanting to happen are getting bigger today. All because of my own head, not because of all the distractions around me, not because of any of that. Right. And so it's all what I was choosing to focus on and, and actually say out loud in the case of today. Um, yeah, your self-talk so, becomes yeah. your self-concept and your self-talk becomes your situation. Yes. And so if it's like, oh, da, 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 that's why I'm always telling people, the, the thing to listen for in your voice and in your tone is always listen to what are you bemoaning, yeah. right? What are, you, what are you bemoaning? Oh, I gotta do this commute. Oh, I gotta do this email. Oh, I gotta do this legal thing. And the more of those, oh, I have to do this, I don't wanna do that, that focus, yeah. that self-talk makes you in, in ways build a, a mental prison yeah. of, of in some ways victimhood that, oh, oh I am, yeah. you know, these things, I have to do these things. Yeah. When, as you mentioned earlier, like, uh, and, and I just know Jamie, Jamie's like on purpose right now. Like she's on, yeah. for those who saw her last Monday or who read the book, believe it, she, she's in a flow. She's in a flow of service right now. And yeah. in, 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 in that flow, one easy way we can all poison our, our flow, our focus, is when we start going, oh, and I have to do all these things. It's like, no, these things are all part of it. Those things all add to the whole. And so listen to your own tonality with yourself. It's like, when you bemoan it, beware. That's what I always say to myself, oh, I'm bemoaning. Oh, beware, Brendan, you're about to, you're about to, you're gonna, you're gonna close off the flow. You're gonna close off 
your heart. You're going to close off your ability mm. to serve at higher levels of energy and frequency that people need. The more that you hate the process, the more the process goes, well, then I ain't going to even know more progress. Mm, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and even just focusing on the tough parts of the process, right? Like, or like this morning, really, it was, I'm so tired. <laughs> like I started focusing on that and I feel like it, it literally magnified and took over my emotions, took over everything. And I had to check myself. Like I had to, like, I really did in terms of even just what I focus on. Do you know what I mean? And, and yeah, it might be true that I'm tired, but there's so many other things too. And I don't want to become more tired. And I think like when I caught myself focusing on that and feeling like, oh, and so, you know, I decided I had to be super intentional this morning about, oh, no, <laughs> I'm going to focus on A, I'm going to catch myself and say, um, if I do share those, if I do think those things, they're just going to perpetuate. You know what I mean? And I had to intentionally shift my focus. And, uh, and I also was honestly, so sometimes when, so I'm in a hotel room, right? And, uh, and you know, I, t I, I always, I learned this lesson the hard way in life that life's not meant to do alone. And, um, and so I intentionally hopped on online this morning and started connecting and reading messages, um, crying my eyes out. Brendan, there is a, a single mom who started a book club with Believe It and, she did a whole post about it. And then she said, and if you're a single mom and want to join my book club and you can't afford to get your copy, I bought two extras and I'll send them to you. Um, and I'm just sitting there sobbing, right? Like, <laughs> so then I took all my author copies from the room next door. Um, I had 10 author copies here that the publisher sent me and I signed them all and like DM'd her. I'm like, How, where can I send these to you oh, at? Give these. That's awesome. They can't afford to get a book. And it's like, I just shifted my focus this morning away from myself and, yes. oh, I'm tired because I don't want to magnify that. And I, but we have to be intentional about this, right? Because it, it would have been way easier to just sit there and, and be like, oh, I'm tired. It's like, oh, okay. I acknowledge that's what I'm focused on. I'm watching myself grow in my, uh, uh, whoa, <laughs> like all the negative stuff I don't want to feel because that's what I'm focused on. Let me shift my focus, let me connect, let me give, and let me do something bigger than myself, right? And listen, sometimes that can be let me walk down the street and wave hi to somebody and tell them I see them. It can be that simple, right? Let me let me text someone who maybe feels alone. It could be that simple. Today for me, it came in the form of, uh, oh wow, this person's story is so amazing what she's doing. How can I, how, how can I serve yes. her? Um, and I had 10 author copies here from the publisher. So I literally signed them and literally mailing them to her saying, can you give these to any single mom who can't afford to grab the book? And it snapped me out of the crap I was focused on for a hot minute. <laughs> and like, yeah, I refocus, love it. right? Refocus on the things I want to magnify, which is the feeling of goodness, of service, of aliveness, of feeling the day, right? Those kind of things. So yeah, yeah. I love that. She used connection. Right. So she started with connection, like, oh, let me let me look outside myself. Let, let me see who I can serve here. Let me see, you know, let me, even if it's even if she went to DM me friends or she went to, yeah. you know, sending audios or videos to people. Many of you guys know we always teach that in growth days, like, hey, send five encouraging voice texts or videos yeah. every day to friends or family or your customers, your teams every day. Uh, it just gets you out of your head and into that. And then the second thing is generosity. Like, oh, I'm going to send these people a free book. I'm going to sign this thing. I'm going, to, I'm going to help these people in this way. It's like it shifts you. Like the higher levels of frequency in your life are always going to come from service. Mm -hmm. They're always going to come from that. That like That's so that true, generosity. Yeah. It's like it's like you want to you want to turn on. Like we do this. Hey, I can promise you guys. Sometimes we do this morning show, and we're we're like setting everything up, and we're trying to we're, we're talking through things as we're setting things up, and we're getting ready, and 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 it's like we're not like enthusiastic or turned on yet, if you will. And then we hit go and now we go, oh, we can add some value here. Oh, this is gonna be fun. And I feel like when you put yourself in play where you can be generous or add value, it turns on your spirit. 
It turns, we hear it all the time from you guys in Growth Day, our Growth Day members like, wow, I finished that live session, I'm fired up. I finished that thing, I did my goals. I finished this and it's just beautiful to see. And I just feel like we all have to remind ourselves that. Don't get stuck in your own thing. However, I will have to say responsibly or people are gonna give me a hard time. And that is this. Also listen to that truth. Yeah. When your body is saying, I am overwhelmed, I am tired. Yeah. Don't just run it over with positive thinking. Also go, I need to make an action plan yeah. to stop taking on so much that I'm overwhelmed yeah. and to stop taking on so much that's compromising my sleep. Our theme this week is becoming more focused and disciplined, but how do you do that and actually have fun? How do you do that and <laughs> do the things that are meaningful to you? And our joy here at the Growth Day Morning Show is just bringing some joy to you, bringing some encouragement, bringing a little bit of reminders that you got this. I know it's hard out there. I know you're bored with quarantine. I know you're just like frustrated with a lot of this going on in the world. And yet every day you still get to choose your attitude. Yeah. What a blessing. What a blessing. Jamie, you got a big two weeks coming up for your book launch. You're focused, you're disciplined. How are you yeah. not stressing yourself out crazy as you're working on a new project because i know a lot of people i did a meditation last night on, on clubhouse and people are like yeah. thank you thank you i needed that i'm so stressed i'm, I'm working so hard i'm just you know it, the anxiety and the you know everything's getting to them and so yeah. how are you dealing with an intense time and staying focused and disciplined when it's so easy to watch netflix instead <laughs> yeah and it's tempting last night i'm not gonna lie i was tempted to watch the bachelor pour some wine in a coffee mug and have some popcorn, but I didn't, I didn't. <laughs> be honest, have you had wine in the growth day mug yet? I have guessing... not, but it's on my goal to-do list <laughs> is, to, is to pour some wine in my growth day mug and uh, yeah. And you know, because the book launched, because we're what, 12 days away, I now have two coffees for growth day because um, right. the book coffee and growth, because it's, you know, early morning. So how I'm staying, you know, one of the things I'm doing, I mean, today was another 4 a.m. morning walk mm. just to stay on because it's a wild day. I have six. Anyone um, else can't do 4 a.m.s? I can't do I know. No. I just but you're, can't. you're a night owl, right? You're more like you create at night. Right. I create right, right. in the morning. I create yeah. in the morning. Yeah. Yeah. That. Yeah, it's it's interesting, right? Everyone's a little different. You guys type below, are you more, you know, a morning, like do you create in the morning or do you get your best ideas? Yeah. Like Early when I wrote bird or night owl, everyone type Early in. Bird Early bird or night owl. owl. So back to Jamie, focus, discipline. <laughs> Brendan, be focused, dude. <laughs> <laughs> this is a funny story. So right before Brendan and I go live, we're both oh, yeah. laughing about all kinds of stuff. Yeah, and then I'm like, wait, wait. And then you're like, wait, what's the theme this week? And then we're like, oh yeah, focus. <laughs> focus. <laughs> we I, are like, totally almost, not focused this morning. <laughs> and I almost spit my coffee out. Cause I'm like, yeah, that's the theme. <laughs> that's definitely the theme. Um, but listen, um, you know, all week we're gonna be talking about frameworks and actionable items and things you can apply to your real life, but we're also gonna be having a lot of fun. And uh, and so my husband Paulo just got his first haircut in the entire past year during quarantine, right? So he's been trying to like shave himself. If I do it and, and I would do it, but there'll be whole big holes. And so he's been doing it <laughs> and he did it outside. So, so, so we had a friend over that did it outside in the driveway and now it's like, great. And so when I saw Brendan this morning, I was like looking at his hair, I'm like, did you just get a haircut too? Like, did you just get a haircut? And you told me, I had no idea. You do your own, like, because you have complicated. You have the fade, you have the thing on a little bit of height on top. And it's you do so it bad, guys. You do no, it I did it. I do it myself. So I have just a, a thing with a guard on it that I got on Amazon for literally $18. And I just go brow, brow, all around. I don't even use a mirror. I just go brow, all the way around. And then I just grab a finger's worth of hair and scissors on the top. That's it. I mean, it, it, it definitely looks better on Instagram than in real life. It's pretty uneven. There it is. It's pretty, it's pretty uneven up there. But 
for straight on shots, just fine. It looks good. There's no holes in anywhere that I've seen. Like there's no, <laughs> when you, you know, when you shave accidentally too close on the side, see people are laughing, right? They're saying, OMG, Ola. exactly. Like I'm surprised more people don't cut their own hair. I mean, you can literally watch a YouTube tutorial. And I mean, here's my thing. Every answer you need is on Google and YouTube. You just have to take the time to look it up and watch. Um, so that's what I do. And so I learned how to do it on YouTube. And how to cut your own hair on YouTube. Yes, too. it was so complicated. I was like, that's so dumb. And so then I saw, uh, uh, you know, this thing I was like, I think I figured it out. And the first time I did it, it was a little too tight, but it's super simple. And I just feel like it's one of those other little things of self-reliance in life. I just mm. feel like you can teach yourself to do so many things. You can teach yourself to work out, you can teach yourself to get healthy. You can teach yourself to be on the internet. You can teach yourself to do video. You can teach yourself to be a better team leader, parent, mom, caregiver. That's the intention of growth is can you learn? Can you teach yourself? Can you take the reins? Because I'm, I, I'm just, for me, where I'm at, I'm just not going to go into a barber shop. I'm just not gonna do it. I'm too, I'm, I'm too COVID squeamish, personally. I just don't wanna do it. And I know that not everyone agrees with that and they think I'm silly and they're like, just double mask with your haircut kid. But I'm just, I said, I'm not gonna do it because uh, I wanna go see my mom. Our parents are in their seventies and I do everything I can possibly do to protect myself because I wanna see mom. Mm -hmm. And so if that means I have to cut my own hair, that seems like a pretty simple sacrifice. I don't know. You know, and it goes back to uh, an example of what you always talk about with confidence, which is just you have this confidence in your ability to figure things out, right? So in the case of, oh, let me figure out how to do my own haircut, you just figure it out. And, you know, it's interesting, pre-YouTube, pre-the internet, like I grew up where the way you figure it out is, you know, either your mom or someone teaches you. And I grew up with my mom, literally, no joke, putting a bowl on my head and cutting, yes, the bowl cutting cut. the bangs around the bowl. And so when you see some of my photos from like third grade, I was like eight years old and it's like a perfect bowl in the school pictures. Um, and then do you guys remember this? Anyone else, by the way, ever use a bowl or have their, their someone in their family use a bowl? Type in the comments if, you, if you've done this or Brendan, you just reminded me of something so funny. I don't know why I find this so funny, but <laughs> did you ever see that infomercial with the Floby? That thing oh. that looks like a vacuum and you put it on the hair and then it- George cuts. Clooney just sold it out by announcing he's been using it his whole career. He uses a Floby his entire career. He's cut his own hair his entire career. He's been using the, the Floby for 20 years. George Clooney announced it like last month I and it sold that. out everywhere overnight. Not kidding you. Yeah. It was a true, crazy thing. Cause he was like, yeah, I just use the Floby. And that, she's like, no, you don't. He goes, yeah, I, I've always used it. <laughs> It's not that. Here's the other thing. I here's here's one thing for those who aren't into trial and error. One reason I'm so good at trial and error in marketing, and one reason I'm so good at Sorry, trial and error. <laughs> the reason I'm so people good are typing that they have the Floby and they use it. Okay, it's great. Trial and error. Trial and error. And this week is focus. How am I not focused today? Sarah? You're the worst today. I don't know what's going I on. Am. I have, is, is it so much? Place. Is it the book launch? I'm just really <laughs> hyper, and I'm not okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna focus. <laughs> but I am disciplined. I did my morning walk. <laughs> I did my morning walk. I'm just so, I've been laughing ever since like your haircut before we started because it looks so good. I'm like, you did it. Okay. Focus and discipline. Oh my gosh. Okay. So my question was how, how do you stay focused and disciplined in intense times like this? I think part of the answer is you don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. I'm teasing a little bit, but it really is super hard right now to be focused it really, I mean, this was our, as a topic. So uh, we've been doing uh, this growth day morning show, Jamie and I for five weeks, every weekday. Right. And we've had a lot of like week one was like vision week. And then we had like some other thing. And then we were figuring it out and there was confidence week. This week is focus and discipline more than any other topic title. This one has gotten higher engagement because people know that in general, they suck at this mm -hmm. and they don't realize that the challenge with focus and discipline is always an emotional regulation challenge. Mm. It's never what you do for a living. It's not your bank account. It's not how many kids you have. It's not the, you know, all the stories we will tell ourselves because we know people who have that big of a team or have that big yeah. of a family or have that many responsibilities and they're able to do it. 
And it comes back to in the science, I'm not making an argument here yeah. against you, but I'm saying in the science that it comes back to an emotional regulation, the ability to have self-control in the midst of distractions and competing interests, because you know what you want. Mm. You're clear. Like yeah. when clarity is down, discipline goes out the door. Mm. When clarity is down, of course you're not focused because your mind is trying to absorb and take in everything so you can find the thing. And so it's actually okay if you're unfocused on discipline, but just know the first step is going to be seeking clarity mm -hmm. and reminding yourself with visuals and notes and cue cards and pop-ups on your phone, what is important? I have to, you guys, everyone teases me about this now, Jamie, because I say it all the time. I have to stand in front of that board over there every day for five minutes to remind me of what's important. Otherwise, I will absolutely run outside and chase cars. I mean, I would, <laughs> like, I, I would be the, the dumbest, happiest dog running all over the place. I am just not built. I'm not, everyone thinks, Brendan, you're so focused. I'm like, I'm not built that way. I've had to train myself that way. Yeah. That's the difference. Yeah, and I think, you know, one of the things I talked about yesterday was just, when I when we think about the one things the one big thing right that moves the needle and then the things that are distractions right and I talked about for me the importance of just walking in the morning and so many people inside the live community talked about how when they do their morning workout or they go for a walk or maybe it's a meditation um, that it literally impacts everything else that it's not even about you know how they feel in the moment of working out or how it, you know the immediate it's it's about that it literally sets up everything else for that and I think to your point about being, you know, having um, clarity, when you talk about clarity, you know, I think that, um, I think that for me, as an example, just just to be super real, before this call, and before I was laughing about haircuts with Brendan and about focus, I literally one of the first things I said to him is, I just missed a huge deadline. And I don't miss deadlines. I was like, I can't believe I, I'm, I go, Brendan, I literally am about to cry this morning. Like I missed one of these in the biggest deadlines uh, for a, a big company that's going to support my book launch. They needed an email. And it's a whole thing. And I was like, I can't believe I did that. And normally I'm so organized, right? And I made the decision in that moment, I'm going to just enjoy and be present with Brendan, talk about his haircut. And I'm going to, when I, when I, when I, hopefully this makes sense. When we talk about clarity, I'm crystal clear because I've spent 10 years working 100 hour weeks building this huge company with thousands of like all the things. And I didn't enjoy it a lot of the times. Like I was so right. And so for this book launch, I'm also working 100 hour weeks, <laughs> but I'm so clear that I want to enjoy it this time. Right. So it's interesting that in this moment where the pre-show to the growth day morning show <laughs> um when i'm like brendan literally i'm about to cry I, j I literally can't believe i dropped this ball it's so unlike me all these things but i'm like you know what i'm i have clarity that this time around i'm gonna enjoy this for me that's the big thing right yes and so <laughs> i'm like oh the flow bee <laughs> and then, like because there's part just of enjoy it that. Yes, just but enjoy it. And you know what? Also, I gave her a little coaching this morning. I said, it's okay. You missed the deadline. Most, A, most deadlines are arbitrary. And I'll just say that for the track record. People need to understand that. But also the mentality here, this will help. Because it's probably the shift of her being able to enjoy things in her life versus where she couldn't before comes back to an unconscious catastrophic thinking. Right, missing a deadline, it's not catastrophic. You'll fix it, you'll get it done. But yep. if you, if it's, oh, the world's falling apart. Oh, I hate myself. Well, that's why people often don't enjoy the life. They're just like, e everything is catastrophic. Everything's a big deal and a drama. I'm not saying this about you. I'm saying this about yeah. people in general yeah. who they, they make these little things that aren't even huge, huge things without realizing, oh, you can improve, you can change it. Get it. You can still. OK, so you missed it by a day. Get it done. You you're like there's so many. If I if I cried on every deadline I missed, I would cry on the hour every day of my life. The number of deadlines that I have built into my life, I would just be like, ah! but I miss a ton of them, a ton of deadlines. And people are like you're the discipline guy. I'm like, yes. 
but I also run all these different companies, do all these different things. Inevitably, somebody put an arbitrary deadline on me and they'd prefer it then, but it's not real. Mm -hmm. If I miss it, I'll catch back up. I'll get back mm -hmm. in it. I'm not flipping about other people's times and schedules. I just know I'll get there. It's cool. I don't, I don't flip out. Yeah, and something you just said that I think is huge, 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 huge in, in distinguishing discipline is you're not you're not saying the big thing is through discipline I will hit every deadline. I feel like what you just said is transcends that. And I think this is huge for everyone, especially people out there who are perfectionists or people out there who are dealing with stuff not going their way. And sometimes it's small things that we miss or mess up. And sometimes it's big things. But what you just said, what I heard, what I heard is not, oh, because I'm mastering discipline, I'm going to hit every deadline. It's, oh, because I'm mastering discipline, I'm going to know how to keep focus with clarity and handle everything and be resilient when I don't hit deadlines. Right? Yes. It's, it's the discipline and the clarity that transcends all that. And that's huge yes. because then we're not, we're not at the mercy of all these things that we're not doing perfectly or balls we're dropping or or mistakes that happen or things that aren't going well in our life and sometimes they're out of our control right with setbacks or how so it's like the discipline isn't in just that the discipline is how do we handle it all with clarity that's huge yes yeah. it's like think of this when i think about like focus and discipline and that part of how how much those two things hang on resilience because you're mm -hmm. going to be focused you're going to break discipline and if you pretend that's not going to happen and every time you break focus or you break discipline, you hate yourself because you missed your morning mm -hmm. routine or you hate yourself because you missed this deadline, that self-hate gathers. And the more that that guilt or that self-dislike for missing things, the more that that gathers and you allow it to, the less resilience you're going to have over a period of time because you now you're chipping away at your own confidence because you're so hard on yourself. And the more you're hard on yourself, the more you took away the confidence. So the two, the only two things that you can do going in is one, just make sure you have clear priorities and perspective. Yeah. I love those two words together, priorities and perspective, because you need perspective to have priorities. And when you have priorities, you need perspective when you miss them or have to reshuffle them. Like most of my week people, I would say 20% of my week is reshuffling things. Mm. Like what? I'm like, oh yeah. 20% of my week is reshuffling things. Yeah. The good news is we learned in High Performance Habits, the, the research, 60% of my week is on the needle moving things. Like the things that move the business forth, build reach and build revenue. Like these are like the things. Everything else is secondary for me as a CEO because that's my job for the team, the company, you guys as an audience, for me to focus on these, just these few specific needle movers. And that's what my encouragement would be today is for everybody, to write down what are the real needle movers that make you happy or give you progress that you feel like, oh, by doing these things, I move forward the most. And if you can just give 60% of your time to those each week, we know, at least from the research, that that's your, your odds of reaching long-term success and being happy about it. That's right there. And then it's just about, I love what Jamie said, She's being present when she's in here, having the perspective to know, okay, I'm here now. I can't deal with those other things right now. The perspective is I, I'm going to be present with this. There's big things. There's this thing and just not blowing things out of proportion. I think that's one reason people lack focus and discipline. They beat themselves up so many times. They actually hurt their confidence, mm -hmm. which hurts mm -hmm. their discipline. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, and this is so good. I think, you know, right now we are in the middle, we're approaching the middle of February, which is wild, right? Crazy. There are so many people that are part of the Growth Day community and that are just hopping into this Growth Day morning show going, who are these two people? What's going on? And Hi, guys. <laughs> it's Brendan and Jamie. We're live Monday through Friday, 7.30 Pacific, every single weekday um, where we all come together to boost joy and inspiration and share and community. And, uh, but, you know, I think Brendan that, you know, a lot of people, I think this is really big, what we're talking about in the sense of a lot of people have gotten to mid February and they started the year off strong, right? Thinking, okay, a lot of people start, or maybe they started the month off strong, right? And they think, here's my big goals, my, you know, all the things. And then when they start missing them, they don't give themselves grace 
exactly what you're talking about. And then they think, oh, okay, I'm starting over next month or I'm starting over next week or I'm starting the diet next Monday or <laughs> all the things. But when we start uh, focusing on the thing we missed, the thing that we didn't, you know, didn't have our focus on, the thing that we, the ball we draw, all those things, and it may even be New Year's goals and New Year's resolutions and all of those things, I feel like we're letting the circumstances of those determine like a way bigger space in our daily life and in our own mindset than it needs to be if we're able to then transcend them. And I just wanna go back to it one more time because I even think for people new to your community, they might see you as someone with a high performance planner and every little thing is, you, you talk about schedule and timing and, 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 and laying it all out and having it planned, right? So I think it might be easy for somebody to think, oh, that's the key to success. And I think this is huge because I think a lot of people probably share this um, in the comments and share this with, with me, this idea that, oh, um, I've let missing those things or missing or dropping off, dropping the balls of my New Year's resolution or falling off the wagon and something or this or that uh, kind of take over or take a bigger space in my own mindset of I've failed or Yes. I, you know, am not doing this enough or well enough or that enough or, oh, I've lost focus, so screw it and uh, I'll figure that goal out later. But no, it's how do you, how do you handle it when that happens is the discipline. Just to go yes. back to that one more time and you sharing this is huge because I know you as a friend in real life. So I know all these things and I think they're so funny when, when, when you might miss a deadline or something like because I think oh good he's human <laughs> all those things because <laughs> I, I know you as a friend but I just want to make sure everyone makes this connection because I think it's our humanness inside all of us where we beat ourselves up a little bit if we miss a deadline or drop a ball or make a mistake or if someone else does something to us that just sucks right and it's not even in, in our control or we haven't kept the promise to ourselves that for this year we're going to do this for our New Year's resolution or X, Y, or Z. You're not saying that day to day as the inventor of the most genius million sold high performance planner, you're not saying that day to day, it all is perfect and that's success. You're saying how you handle it when you miss all the deadlines, how you handle it is, 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 is everything. Can you just share that one more time? Cause this is huge yeah. for a lot of people who are starting to just doubt themselves or feel bad that they, you know what I mean? That that we're in the yeah. middle of fab and things aren't going as they planned. Yeah, let's work. Let's work backwards through this conversation. So, if you are lacking focus and discipline, we can work backwards from that and go. Oh, there's some emotional regulation issues here that are preventing me from being more focused or disciplined. Working backwards from that, it usually comes down to clarity and confidence. Clarity is, oh, I know what I want. I have my priorities. I get what that is. And confidence is, oh, when I mess up, I can keep perspective and still stay present and keep working forward versus stopping. It's when you recognize, oh my gosh, I wasn't focused this morning, so F the whole day, I'm gonna go <laughs> sit down with seven buckets of ice cream and seven seasons of Netflix. Like that's, that's not gonna make you feel better about yourself. It's gonna give you short-term comfort, but then the next day, you don't trust yourself to show up when you mess up. You don't trust yourself to show up when you get unfocused or you didn't fulfill the thing or meet the deadline. And so I think it's really important to go, oh, okay, focus and discipline then ultimately comes from clarity and confidence. Am I clear about what I want and why it matters? Do I remind myself of that? Do I have the confidence to step forward each day in doing it and then have the confidence to be resilient when I don't get it right? and keep it all in perspective, clarity and confidence come together to perspective to go, oh, I missed this thing. Okay, guess what? There's wars happening in other countries. Mm, yeah. I wanted to ask you, Jamie, like at the heart of this book, and you just sort of talked about it, but at the heart of this book, there's this tension between listening to yourself yeah. trusting your instincts mm -hmm. and and heeding the advice of perhaps people who have more experience than you do in a particular area you know this idea of intuition versus versus expertise mm -hmm. how in your opinion based on your experience how does one strike that balance in business 
and in, in life. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I feel like that's like the defining question for sure. Of, of if we end up going after our dreams or if we talk ourselves out of our own truth. And, and yep. here's what I mean by that is I have the great honor now and great blessing of having so much, uh, invaluable advice from experts that have, that's helped me a ton. That's guided me a ton. Right. Um, but everyone has an opinion yeah. <laughs> and you know, uh, my journey and, and I love I love this question so much because I think anyone joining us right now or watching this on the replays after who is maybe a makeup artist or a stylist or whatever it is, and, and they're doing their own business. Um, my journey was uh, years and years and years of everyone, especially in the beginning, um, saying that what I was doing, that I needed to change what I was doing if it was going to work. Right. Yeah. So I, you know, I have a um, skin condition called rosacea, which is hereditary. There's no cure for it and gets really bumpy and red. And I was in what I thought was my dream job in television news. And, uh, I kept here, I would hear my earpiece from my producer. There's something on your face. There's something on your face. You need to wipe it off. And and it was the makeup breaking up. And long story short, I started like an obsession trying to find something that would work and yeah. nothing did. And that's really what sparked the idea for It Cosmetics. But when I launched the company, um, uh, there was really, you know, this was pre-YouTube when I first launched it and nobody was showing real people yet, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so right. I had this like vision, what if I show how the product actually works on my bright red bumpy skin and what if i have you know diff, you know models all ages shapes sizes gender identity skin tone skin which was everything. probably generic yeah and i was like and so then i thought this makes so much sense right brian like like intuitively and i believe every one of us every person with us live right now everybody watching this every one of us has a, a knowing uh, yeah. inside our own gut. I believe it's always right. Yeah. And I just sat there and intuitively, I would say to the buyers at all the department stores and the beauty retailers that were telling me no, I would say to them, and even QVC, all of them, for three years, they all told me no, I wasn't the right fit. I needed to change our packaging. I couldn't use models that were real people, or it would never sell. Yeah. And I would say to them, okay, but intuitively, if I'm you know, wanting to buy a product and I don't see someone who looks like me showing, you know, with the product on, how do I know it's going to work for me? Right. And this, this went on for three years and it was no after no, after no, after no. And, um, I think every one of us, no matter what journey we're on, has somebody look us in the eye and tell us, no, <laughs> you're not the right fit. You're not enough. You don't belong. You need to change who you are if you want us to carry your product. Mm. And I feel like sometimes experts give feedback and it's a gift and it's helpful. And a lot of times it's not. And mm. I think our life comes down to learning to hear our own gut instinct and say, yeah. is that right for me? Is that advice right for me? Is that a yeah. gift? Should I apply that? Right. And a lot of times I would say, Oh yeah, that was good. That was good. I didn't realize the font in my packaging wasn't big enough. I didn't those things. But other times, and this was three years, and like we got down to under a thousand dollars. Everyone knows right. the highlight reel, Brian. Everyone knows, oh, you know, this girl sold her company for a billion dollars. It Cosmetics today is the largest luxury makeup company in the country. But this is why I thought it was so important to write this book because when we just see the highlight reel, we feel alone in our own setbacks, alone right. in our own struggles, alone in our own rejections. So I lay it all out there yeah. because had I ever, like, like when I look back at the mistakes I made, the things I did wrong, they almost always come down to when I didn't trust myself. Right. And I just think it's such a universal thing. And had I ever, cause, cause we have moments in life where it's like our guts on one hand, experts opinions on the other. And if they differ, wh which one do we listen to? Right. The defining moments of how it cosmetics turned into a billion dollar company are sim simply come down to decisions where I didn't listen yep. to people who told me to change what I was doing, even if it meant I could get into their stores. Yeah. I, I, I trusted my gut on the journey. Yeah. Um, and that's also what made all the difference. Like, you know, even L'Oreal for a long time said to change different things in our meetings. And some of them were so valuable and so helpful. But when we eventually became part of the L'Oreal family, 
I think why they acquired us is because we were doing stuff so different <laughs> from all their other portfolio companies that it was we complimented, right? So right. anyways, trusting your gut, I think, is the victory in life, not yeah. the outcome of your company. Yeah. How have you emotionally caught up to your success? And mm-hmm. I don't know if that's even clear, but it's like you have done a lot. In, and when, when you look back, I'm sure it didn't feel like at the time, but a, a lot in a very short amount of time, like the, the level of success with what it cosmetics has done and what you have done. When you look back, how have you emotionally caught up to what that means? Um, and even financially, like how mm-hmm. you've been like, oh my gosh, like I'm not saving tip money anymore. For, how have you kind of kept up with that? And even the, your sense of self, you know, through that. Yeah. So there's things that I've done right and things I've done wrong. Um, one thing I did wrong in the journey was, you know, I got to the point where I was working 100 hour weeks and I almost became like addicted to work mm-hmm. and busyness. Yeah. Uh, and and I went through this journey of learning that like busyness is actually like any other addiction where it separates, it like numbs us, separates us from ourselves. And I realized, which is also part of why I thought, okay, let's really partner with L'Oreal because I need to really make, as an entrepreneur, some fundamental shifts in my life. Um, But the one thing I did wrong was work 100 hour weeks and cause myself to burn out all those things. Um, The thing I think that I did right from the beginning um, and even now in this moment uh, now that my circumstances are very different, is I've I've always known, and this comes from I think my faith deep down inside. I've always known that like what I'm called to do isn't about me, and so for me, it's it's what's fueled me in all the times when it seemed like no one else believed in me. Like I knew why I was doing this um, was so much bigger than myself, mm-hmm. and to really shift culture and beauty. And even now, even just saying like, oh my gosh, you started something in your living room and someone pays you a billion dollars for it. Like, if I think about that, I can't even process right, that. Yeah, yeah. Like, I can't even handle it. Because what happens is I'll start thinking of like, oh, but, you know, I don't, I didn't come from the right family. No one of my, neither of my parents went to college. Like, all those things that we tell ourselves about why we're not the person that has those kind of things happen right, to us. Right. Um, and so, so two things. One, I, I often remind myself that like anything that's ever been created that's great or that's a brand we all use now or a big business, like it was all created by somebody really at the end of the day who's just like you and me, right. who's just like all of us, every single thing, right? So like, why not us? Why not you? Why yeah. not? Yeah. And then, and then the other thing is like when I really start to um, kind of like get in my own head about it, because mm-hmm. it is really strange to yeah. say like, oh yeah, like <laughs> all those things. Like um, I I make it not about my, I, I know, I remind myself it's it's not about me, right? So for my book, for example, I'm donating 100% of the proceeds, right? Like, like I, the the book is to serve, right? And like, I, I believe at the end of the day that we get in life like what we give, you know what I mean? Along this whole journey, I've known it's bigger than myself. Even now, like I just, I don't know, I believe that, you know, I'm called to serve and, and to, like I feel blessed to have accomplished one of my biggest dreams, but my my biggest my biggest driver now is helping other women yeah. um, and especially their entrepreneurs, um, but really other women like a- accomplish their greatest dreams. Yeah. And like, for me, that isn't really about me. And so right. it drives me. And and then I don't, I don't freak out over things like, oh yeah, I sold my business for a billion dollars, which if I think about it, I can't process it really. Right. Um, and so I just have to flip it in my mind as, okay, maybe this is a cool example that is another example for other other entrepreneurs of like, it's possible for them. Right, right. You know? Yeah, I love that example. We, When we teach often about the power of your thoughts, we use the example of the four-minute mile. It had never been broken, you know, yeah. until Roger Bannister broke it. And then after he broke it, it was broken, you know, six more times that year and 500 times since then because someone showed that it was possible. And yes. so it's just, it's it's amazing to think of the, the million-dollar businesses, the billion-dollar businesses that will be birthed because, like Oprah did for you, you were doing for others of showing that it's possible. I'd like you to rewind a bit and share this concept that I first learned in your book, and that is that you were kind of always on a quest for achievement, and it was sort of how you were finding love. I mean, you were in early in life, you were a very driven person. 
you were the high school valedictorian, you had a 4.0, you went on to become Miss Washington, you competed in the Miss USA pageant, you were a well-accomplished television journalist. Unpack this insight that you share around how perhaps your achievement of accomplishments and accolades was an attempt to find love. Yeah. I, uh, lifelong journey on figuring that one out. And, um, yeah, so I, w I went through growing up with parents who worked super hard, like really, really hard. I was the first person in my family to ever go to college. And, you know, I started working really hard at a young age. So pushing grocery carts in the Safeway grocery parking lot. And I eventually was a waitress at Denny's to, to pay my way through school. And I always had, so, so two things on that, Scott, um, I always had this feeling inside, like even when I was waitressing Denny's, I didn't want, I didn't know one day I would be running a billion dollar company and have a, you know, billion dollar exit to, to L'Oreal and all those other things. But I did know inside that I've, I've always felt, um, I think God makes every one of us special. And I always had this feeling inside, like I was, you know, made for more, whether it was to give or to serve. Um, I had something in me to offer the world, but I, I, I still doubted myself. And for many years of my life, and actually it's probably, a lot of people think my book is just, oh, how did you build a billion dollar company? It's really a book about how do you go from not believing in yourself to believing in yourself and not trusting yourself to trusting yourself and, 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 and hearing your own gut and trusting it. Cause I think that's really foundational for leadership, but also whether you want to build an amazing life or an amazing company um, or an amazing team. Um, but that's very different than this idea of, I, I need to achieve um, to have love, which was a big theme in my life. And I didn't realize that until I was an adult. Um, I grew up with, with parents that worked all the time and I, uh, realized <laughs> not, I wasn't fully aware of this, but when I would achieve something big, um, that was when they would show up. Right. And so I can look back and recognize that now. Um, and what I realized is for a big journey of my life, I equated like, oh, I've got to win um, uh, to matter where I've got to achieve, uh, to, um, to matter, i.e. to feel love. Right. So I look back and I realize that was a definite pattern. And I think for every achiever out there, whether they're type three on the Enneagram or they're just simply, you know, so driven, I think the biggest thing that has been, and on top of it all, and I share this in the book for the first time ever in, in my late twenties, I found out by complete surprise that I was adopted. Um, and I went on this multi-year search trying to find my birth mom and also trying to um, trying to learn how to forgive and all those things. I, so anyone who's ever had kind of the rug pulled out from underneath them <laughs> um, by someone that they thought they knew or, or loved or trusted, I, I talk about that journey of forgiving and healing as well. Um, and, you know, I think that um, it's been a lifelong journey of trying to understand the need to achieve uh, and, and how sometimes we can equate that to love and separating that um, from I'm enough, right? Separating I'm not enough, I need to achieve uh, to find love uh, to I'm enough. And this is gonna sound, I guess, soft to talk about, but I think this is an issue that impacts as many men and as, as it does women. I think it's an issue that is especially impacts leaders and CEOs because by nature, they're achievers <laughs> and by nature, they're driven. And one thing I talk about in this book a lot is coming to the realization that when you are an achiever and you're just trying to get the next thing and the next thing and the next thing, it's never enough. And it never actually brings fulfillment. Um, and until what you're doing is completely bigger than yourself and in service to other people, that's really where joy and fulfillment in life comes in. It's also where joy and fulfillment as a leader comes in. It's where joy and fulfillment uh, for your own teams comes in, right? To go back to like the why beneath the why, I mean, it was so much bigger than ourselves. Um, to, to shift culture in the whole beauty industry for every little kid is about to start doubting themselves and every grown woman who still does um, is a very big, bigger than ourselves why that every person on our team, once we grew and grew and grew, could deeply identify with. So being in service for something greater than ourselves, I believe is one of the, the, the pieces of our secret sauce that allowed us to 
enter an industry of giants, pass all of these people. People used to say you could never break into the beauty industry because all the department store uh, floor space was controlled by a small number of giants, et cetera, et cetera. And we were able to break in and pass all of them. And I believe a big part of that is because the, the authentic reason for why we were doing what we were doing was bigger than ourselves. A lot of companies will have a why that's attached to sales or, you know, they think rewarding employees with bonuses and this and that is enough uh, to have retention. Um, but I really believe how we scaled is because the, the why was so much bigger um, than ourselves in service. Uh, was it was a big component of it and it was authentic right and I think the same thing for anyone who's an achiever in life um, I think the same thing is true is a lot of times people continue who are achiever based continue to accomplish and accomplish and achieve and get praise from the outside world because they have what the world tells them success looks like um, but they're not fulfilled and I think that you know step one is becoming aware of it oh, wow, <laughs> I actually have thought accomplishment or achievement um, is significance or is love. And being aware of it, being like, that's not true because, and we know it's not true because it never feels fulfilling when, when we achieve another thing, right? And then taking the step beyond to realize like, oh yeah, when I, when I live my life in service of others, when I approach the day with, um, how can I give? How can I serve? Um, who, I think it was my friend Brandon Burchard that said, like, when you walk in a room, instead of saying, look at me, um, you say, I see you, right? When we switch our mindset to that, whether it is in the workplace or in our daily lives, I think that is one of the foundational steps to overcoming that whole achiever thing. Because, And it doesn't mean you're less competitive um, at all, it, at all. But it means that your your competition shifts. And what I mean by that is I talk a lot in the book about this journey of competition, this journey of how I saw the competitive landscape, um, this journey of how I made sure I didn't get distracted by what our competition was doing and let it tempt me or my teams to dilute their own secret sauce. And I talk a lot and believe it about realizing like really realizing this lesson that I believe in every ounce of my being, which is that as individuals, we're not here on this earth to compete with anyone else. We're here to compete with the person God made us capable of becoming, right? And when I think of who God made me capable of becoming, I know I'm nowhere there yet. And I know that person, while I want to give and serve and all that, who he made me capable of becoming kind of has nothing to do with uh, titles or accolades or things I achieve or money in the bank. It's, am I serving? at the highest level? Am I using everything that he gave me to be, to live in a life of service that actually makes a difference for other people? And so for me, when we measure our own um, achievement that way, that's when it becomes fulfilling. Um, and so it's been a big life lesson for me. And I still right now, and I'm sure Scott, you do as well, know so many people that the world tells them every day <laughs> that what they're doing is successful, but they're not happy. And I think it's because they haven't crossed that threshold from achievement uh, for themselves to none of those things matter. What matters is, am I, am I living a life in service that, that's greater than myself? Am I using all the gifts and talents that I've been blessed to be born with? to live a life in service and, and make a difference. And that can come at the core of every for-profit company and for-profit leader, as well as, of course, nonprofit and everything else. But that that's an internal, like leadership is an internal job first. Jamie, so beautifully said. As leaders, when those hard things are going on internally, you still have to show up <laughs> and lead and inspire your teams, right? And and being able to do that and and um, and still feel the day was something I failed at for a number of years. Being able to do that and still summon joy was something I failed at for a number of years. And it's something when I look back, I would do differently. Um, it got to the point where you know I was so burnt out and driving myself so hard in the business so hard that, you know, and my husband was too, um, when I would get a phone call from my own husband, I actually, when I'd see his name on my cell phone, I actually would equate it in my brain to a work call. 
Like that's where we got to that place. And so, you know, for me, we had the opportunity to go public and probably would have made way more money. And I, I would fantasize about this idea of ringing the bell and all those sexy things. But I also realized if I want to feel the day, live a joyful life, um, all of those things, become a good steward of my own body and a stronger leader for myself, for my family, and even for my own teams, I was at this point, Scott, where I had to trust myself not to trust myself because I was so addicted to work at that point. And I knew if we went public, it would still all be right. on me. I'll right. be on us to carry it, right? So part of, of why we decided to um, to bring on a partner, right, which L'Oreal acquired 100% of our business, was to make that decision. I want to do this also joyfully. Um, and so you don't need to sell your company to L'Oreal to have this aha moment. But I realized I was doing it wrong. I realized, and, and this is something that a lot of people go through this experience where we're really amazing at our jobs or at building teams or leading teams or ideating or creating, but maybe we're not good stewards of a body. Maybe we're not good um, uh, partners, or maybe we're just not even feeling the day and feeling alive and enjoying the journey. And so for me, having that epiphany was huge because if I could do it over again, um, and I protected my teams, I made sure that, you know, that they really were always inspired, that they, uh, you know, we did things that filled everyone else with joy. But as a leader internally, that was, a, that was a, a journey for me to try and get to that point of realization. Um, of, of celebrating the wins. And so, you know, I have to do that intentionally now. I have to be super intentional about celebrating wins. When Believe It just made the, the New York Times bestseller list, that night I had so much to do. And I'm like, nope, you know what? I literally opened a half bottle of wine. <laughs> with, we each had, to, I was with a friend and we each opened a half bottle of wine. We cheers. I poured it in this coffee mug and I'm like, I, I'm going to celebrate right now. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I think we have to be so intentional about it because before we know it, the months go by, the years go by, the, you know, the decades go by. And all we ever did was work really, really well. You know what I mean? Jamie Kern Lima, you are damn smart. Tell me about marriage and business then and boundaries around that. If someone's in a relationship right now and they're in total love, and they're the dating for years or they're oh, good. Oh yeah, I just something? thought, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I mean, listen, I think that um, along the lines of Oprah's advice, just when people show you who, who they are, believe mm -hmm. them the first time, I think yeah. that I would have I would have followed that advice more with, closely. With I still vendor, work on it. With the vendors, employees, with mm -hmm. team, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's hard. Yeah, it's hard when you don't want to hurt other people. Um, <sighs> but, yeah. but, and again, I've had other entrepreneurs, you know, um, after doing a thousand live shows, I've met tens of thousands of brand founders in the green room of QVC and entrepreneurs. And they've all said the same thing, that if you keep a toxic employee um, in your business, even if you love them or they're doing a great job in some areas, that what happens is they, it, it's almost like a, a, a cancer in the sense it of it will, it'll spread it and it'll infect everyone else. You cannot allow negativity or gossip yeah. or drama exactly. in your culture. Otherwise, you need yeah. to cut that out. It's contagious. It is the worst thing. Yeah. And I think everyone yeah. needs to create a boundary as a business owner to ensure and communicate responsibly what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you don't communicate it effectively, that's on you. Yeah. And if people are and dramatic and this and that, that's on you. So you got to make sure you're constantly in that communication. Yeah. And and I think that the challenge a lot of people face too is when people grow with you. Um, they, right? Yeah. They can you you almost in a way when you're growing so fast because we were growing way faster than our infrastructure could keep up yeah. with. So then you have people wearing a lot of hats and of then as a business owner, a lot of people will relate to this, right? And maybe you've gone through this too that sometimes you'll have an employee and you actually really feel like you are depending on them. You know what I mean? And like you can't lose them. So you and deal so, with the toxicity here and there because yeah. they're And you never here. should, but it's hard in the I moment. Know, it's, hard. it's hard in the moment to lose someone who you feel like you really need. Of course, or someone you've built a relationship with over years is challenging. Or you don't even know how are you gonna absorb their role at that moment, but every time you always it's figure like, it out. You, you always figure it out. And someone better someone always comes always along. Figure it out. And, and then you're like, always. And you're like, wait a minute, who was this person a month ago? It's yeah. like, it's, you always figure it out and someone's like, step why didn't up. they do that sooner? Exactly. Mm -hmm. always. always. What was the longest you went keeping someone on? 
that you knew your gut was telling you, oh, I gotta let them go. Yeah. Was Four it years. Six? No. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We've all done it in relationship, intimate yeah. relationships, where we we knew, but it's like we waited six months, yes, two years, six years, yes, until we and you, finally broke yeah. free. Yeah, and you think it's going to get better, they're going to change, or oh it goes back to that Maya Angelou quote that Oprah talks about, also being her her greatest lesson, and 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 a lot of us learn it over. We need to learn it over and over and over and over. Yeah, um, and people show you who they are, believe them the first time. Ladies and gentlemen, rock this house and welcome to the stage, Jamie Kern Lima! Jamie Kern Lima! Every single one of us has had someone tell us we're not enough. Every single one of us has had someone say words to us that hurt. 